Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Norma, and I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to the Pacific Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. The format of this meeting is two 10-minute speakers, a coffee break, and a main speaker. Our first 10-minute speaker is Brenda W. I'm Brenda Wilson. I'm an alcoholic. And I want to thank Kim for asking me to do this. It's a privilege. And as soon as I stop hyperventilating, I'll start talking. Um, and it's exciting for me to be in front of my home group and to be um, to see where I came from and where I'm at today. You know, I came through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous December 14th of 1986, and I didn't come here because because I wanted to, because I liked it. I came here, as Vince likes to say, because I was beaten. I was surrender. I was done. I didn't know where else to do. And I knew that you came here to stop drinking, you know, and um, it was, I was willing to turn myself to these gray people with gray hair and thin lips, because that's, that's what they look like to me, you know. But I'll tell you a little bit what it used to be like. I, I used to drink, and I loved to drink. And I said it Saturday night, you know, my favorite drink was a tall can of English 800. You know, nothing put me right there, and you know what right there is, like a tall uh, can of beer, of uh, English 800 in particular. But unfortunately, that's not the only thing I did, you know. And in the days that I started drinking, I was 17 and a half, 18. I had just arrived at, in the United States, and I was doomed from the get-go because my main name in my main name is La Fiesta. And for those of you who speak Spanish, it means the inn party. And uh, I had one thing in my mind from very early on, and that was to party, and at all cost. And I love to party, and I love to drink, and I learned about consequences right away. You know, I knew that, you know, I was going to get a hangover. I knew that what would happen if I drank too much, but I was willing to pay it, you know. And I remember listening to... Um, Johnny H., when I was new, you know, and he was talking about the phenomenon of craving. And, you know, of course, I didn't have a clue about what that was at that time. But I can tell you that at that time, I was definitely in the phenomenon of craving. I, I took one drink, and I couldn't stop. You know, I love to drink. And if I would still be able to do it, I would still be doing it. I just can't do it anymore. Um, somewhere around 1985, I got arrested by the Santa Monica police. And I got a uh, sentence, and I mean sentence. I, I remember being brought in front of a judge, and the judge said, you know, uh, I'm going to sentence you to six Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And I remember raising my hand and saying, you know, excuse me, but, you know, I am really not an alcoholic. And the lawyer just nailed me. He said, shut up, he's going to give you more if you keep talking. And I thought, oh, I will be quiet because six was bad enough. You know, six was really bad. And I remember going to uh, the Solana Club in the west side, and I sat right up front, and I looked at the steps, and, and I thought, how nice for them. You know, if I looked like that, I would really stop drinking. Because there was a guy that got up to the podium, you know, and he had a bunch of tattoos, you know, and, and he said, you know, my name is Bill, and I'm an alcoholic, and uh, my life is miserable. And I thought, yeah, and go have a cocktail, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll go have one for you because, uh, you know, I, I couldn't deal with these people. They were so boring. They were so gray, you know, and uh, I love uh, really uh, cool people, you know, and I thought I was one of them. I, I like the way uh, girls dressed and, you know, uh, nice suits and all that stuff. And these people look like they didn't have a job. You know, I had a job. I had a car. I had a place to live, you know, but... So I wasn't ready, basically. And I would go back to drunk driving school and tell them all about how I hated Alcoholics Anonymous. 
and how they all smoke too much and you know they drank too much coffee and I just they were just not my kind of people. And I met this guy at uh, drunk driving school who told me about this group of people on the west side that were having a lot of fun in sobriety, that were into action, and they were doing a lot of fun things in sobriety. And I said, thank you, but no thank you. And I threw the meeting directory in my bag, and I went along, you know, my way. And uh, I, you know, I tried everything. That was in Chapter 3. You know, I tried going to the gym, you know. I was talking to someone who's new before the meeting, and I, and, you know, I did exactly what you're talking about, Mary. I went to the gym, I did yoga, I did this, I did that. I switched from brandy to wine. I, I, you know, I tried to do everything but to stop drinking. And, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous has planted, had planted the seed, and the seed was that, you know, I had no power. And I'm so grateful for that information because I always thought there was something wrong with me, but for me to have walked in here and to have learned that I had a disease, that I had absolutely no power over it, and that I had to admit to my animal self that I was an alcoholic, you know. And that moment happened for me on December 14th of 1986, you know. I admitted to my animal self that I had of myself. I couldn't do, I couldn't do anything. And I came wandering into the Pacific group a couple of weeks after I got sober, and I ran into that guy that I had met in drunk driving school. And my best idea was to get engaged to him. You know? uh, and it got me fired. My sponsor fired me very quickly. As a matter of fact, his sponsor fired him because he already had some other girl pregnant in the group. So, um, you know, it used to be where, you know, people thought that when you walked into a room they were talking about you. You thought you were ta- they were talking about you. Well, in this case, they were talking about us, you know, because it was really charming to see us sitting, you know, the, all of us growing in every way possible, you know, and um, it made it for a very rough first year of sobriety. And uh, luckily, you know, luckily somewhere in my drunken stupor, I had uh, gotten married and uh, Stephen went to get our license, you know, at the city hall. And he came back and he said, I'm sorry, honey, but we can't get married. And I said, why? He says, because you already are. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I had to go on the hunt to find this guy that I had married, you know, God knows when and where. And uh, it took me it took me three years to find him and to get a divorce from this guy. And, and during this time, it was great because it, was, it gave us a chance to work the steps, you know, and uh, to get a little sober, a little longer before we took the big steps, but, you know, my life is absolutely incredible. You know, what uh, What happens to me, though, you know, and I've been sober a little while, is that everything looks so great, you know, and I'm, I'm in action. I remember my friend Dino saying, you know, look around the room and pick the winners, you know, and in this room, if you're new here tonight, there's a lot of winners, you know, and I stuck by the winners, and uh, I was in action, and I was very active, and I was doing the steps, and I was, you know, Stephen and I were Mr. and Mrs. AA. But what happens to me and my alcoholism is that everything starts to look so great, you know, the perfect husband, the perfect children who I have been blessed by, you know, do I, that I didn't deserve, and I have the perfect job. I'm so glamorous working out of the country and, you know, getting into limos and all this wonderfulness, just this such a great life. And then all of a sudden, I get the call of the wild. And I, I don't think in any other room would they understand what the call of the wild means to me, you know. I think you would understand what the call of the wild means. And I start to see how I can stir up the pot, you know, and how can I get fixed because this hole is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And Alcoholics Anonymous is not my priority anymore. See, you don't understand that my work is out there someplace, you know. And I start to drift away. And I'm forever grateful that my sponsor and the people in this room, you know, my husband and, uh, and the people that I've known, you know, uh, people like, you know, Byron and Marion and, and, and all these people are here to insist that we put alcoholics on us first, you know. And little by little, I was wheeled back to a, and, you know, I stand here without a, having to, as they call it, relapse, you know, what I like to call it is to really go for the gusto, you know, and to uh, destroy my life, because I I hand over my life when I do this kind of stuff, you know, and um, 
I can't thank you enough, and uh, thanks for letting me share. Our second 10-minute speaker is Morgan D. Good evening. My name is Morgan and I'm an alcoholic. I want to thank uh, Kim for uh, asking me to share tonight. It's an honor and a privilege. Uh, I had the privilege of actually uh, uh, being witness to the courtship of uh, Kim and Kenny after a watch one night uh, many, many moons ago. And, uh, um, you know, we've uh, been in each other's lives ever since uh, playing softball. And I want to thank her again for asking me to speak tonight. If you're new, I want to welcome you if you're new. Uh, when I was new, I just didn't know what the heck was going on. And, uh, but, uh, I knew that, uh, you know, there's something magical and powerful going on in these meetings. And for the first time in my life, you know, I identified. Uh, growing up, I always felt different, always felt afraid. Um, you know, like they say, I was waiting for the spaceship to come home and pick me up. Uh, I always thought, uh, you know, that I should have been born maybe a decade earlier, maybe in the 60s, um, maybe in the late 1800s. You know, I just didn't feel like I fit in. And, uh, I wanted to, you know, be somewhere else, live in a different era. And, uh, and you know, and I came in Alcoholics Anonymous and, uh, you know, uh, people were talking the same way, you know, about not uh, fitting in, feeling different, feeling afraid, and I'd never heard anybody uh, say those things before. And, uh, you know, for me, alcohol was a great elixir that uh, made it feel, made me feel even, made me feel part of, part of my peers, uh, accepted by my peer group. You know, growing up, I was, uh, you know, as a small kid growing up, always afraid, I always seem to be getting beat up every day. Um, you know, guys like Charles Coughlin beat me up after school and, uh, um, you know, and <laughs> stayed away from uh, Culver Boulevard down there. And, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, my first drunk, uh, you know, with my, my buddy down the street, um, you know, we, we had uh, known alcohol does something to you. Uh, you know, we watched TV. Uh, you know, we, uh, my uh, idols were uh, Hawkeye and BJ from MASH. And, uh, I wanted to be like them. And, uh, so one day, uh, one day, uh, my buddy's parents were out of, his parents were out of town and he had a tower, black, liter of black tower whiskey underneath the kitchen sink. And, uh, we, uh, rounded up some shot glasses and, uh, proceeded to play mash checkers. And, uh, what mash checkers is, is we watched an episode of mash where they were playing checkers with their martini glasses. And every time they would jump, they'd, you know, take back their martini glasses. And, uh, so we set up the shot glasses and poured the black tower whiskey and started to play checkers. And, uh, you know, we'd take a shot. And, uh, after every shot, we'd, we'd get up and we'd, uh, we'd walk, uh, walk us, try to walk a straight line because we knew alcohol was supposed to not be, uh, not make you be able to walk a straight line. So we would do that. And, uh, that night, uh, my first drunk, I had 13 shots of black tower whiskey. And, uh, I love that feeling it gave me. Uh, you know, I, I can just remember, you know, trying to take that step and just kind of falling down. Uh, face first on the floor. Uh, I was laughing. The room was spinning. I just loved that feeling. And, you know, and, uh, I wanted to do it again. And, uh, you know, being 13 years old, it's, uh, alcohol's hard to come by, but we had the local liquor store up the street where, you know, we'd uh, stand outside and, uh, you know, pimp some beer, pimp some booze, try to get people to buy it for us. Um, and that's what we did. And, uh, you know, we, we'd come by it how we could. And, uh, you know, 16 years old, I, uh, I got, uh, you know, the best job that you could have if you're an alcoholic, pubescent, 16-year-old. I got a job working at Chippendales. And uh, every night, uh, women would put money in my hand. They'd give me singles, $5 bills, $10 bills, $20 bills. You know, being a parking attendant was a great job at Chippendales. <laughs> and, and uh my, uh, my alcoholism, uh, really took off from there. Uh, you know, it was high school, people didn't accept me. You know, I was like one of five, uh, back in the 80s, you know, New Wave was in. I was one of five New Wave kids in the high school, uh, predominantly of, uh, you know, uh, skinheads and, uh, heavy metal guys. And, uh, so, you know, I come to, I come to Chippendales and people are drinking. And for the first time, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm accepted. They're like, hey, Morgan, you know, welcome. You know, you're a good kid. Here, have a booze. You know, have some drinks. And, uh, you know, there were beautiful women there, and it was just great. And, uh, you know, my drinking really progressed. You know, they, they allowed me to come in the club uh, on my nights off. I'm 16, 17 years old, and I'm hanging out with, you know, 21s and above and just getting drunk every night. And, uh, 
you know, at that at that club too, uh, you know, part of my story got me out of Alex Thomas. I, I started uh, I started a little business in the parking lot uh, selling cocaine, and uh, you know, we were the holders, and the mater D was the middleman, and it was great, and uh, for a while, and uh, and uh, you know, so that's you know, my life progressively went downhill since uh, after that. And, uh, you know, at 19 years old, uh, you know, a daily routine for me uh, working there, you know, as I get up about noontime, uh, you know, go go try to get drunk or whatever. Uh, I'd start work at the club at about 5.30 and I had my fake ID by that time. I'd uh, pick up either, you know, a 12 pack of, of beer if it was summertime or a fifth of uh, whiskey or tequila if it was wintertime, just depended on the weather. And, uh, you know, I'd drink that all night. Uh, Nine o'clock, we'd have a break. I'd get some more. Uh, Twelve o'clock would come. It'd slow down. We'd get some more. And uh, you know, 1:55 a.m., we're running down to 7-Eleven for two o'clock call and uh, get some more beer. And uh, you know, and then just go home at uh, five o'clock in the morning. Uh, keep drinking. Pass out. You know, wake up about three o'clock. Do it all over again. You know, just day after day after day. And you know, I knew part of me was saying, you know, I really need to stop this. You know, I really need to stop doing this. I'm going to kill myself. But on the other hand, there's another part of me saying, you know, if I if I do stop, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to die if I stop, and I'm, I'm going to die if I don't. And I was stuck in that dilemma. And uh, what happened was uh, our dealer uh, was uh, good friends with uh, uh, or my dealer's my dealer's girlfriend was uh, friends with my ex girlfriend, and they got to chatting. And I got a, my mom got a call from my ex girlfriend saying, you know, do you know the business and Devers uh, Morgan's doing? And uh, she said, no, I didn't know. And uh, so I walk in and. You know, my mom's like, well, what's this all about? What are you going to do? And, uh, you know, part of me, you know, the heat was on. So I said, well, let's get help. And, uh, you know, so I tried going to outpatient program a couple nights a week. You know, we, we were, they were doing diagrams and videos, uh, Father Cherry, Ta- Father Cherry Chop Talk and, uh, and, you know, charts and graphs and, uh, bell curves and, uh, you know, and they, and they mentioned these things called steps. And he said, okay, you know, you're going to do these step things, but, uh, you know, not quite yet. You know, you just, why don't you go to some meeting over here? And I didn't know what a meeting was. Um, you know, I, I had no desire to do that. And, you know, I was still just going back to the club at night, getting drunk, drinking more, doing it all over again. And, uh, you know, finally, uh, you know, one last time, uh, you know, as part of my story, I didn't, you know, I didn't think really alcohol was a problem. You know, I was going to South Patient for cocaine. Uh, one night, my buddy of mine was, uh, you know, he was an employee of Federal Express, and they had, you know, found or come across, you know, a FedEx shipment of cocaine, you know, and uh, so the FedEx guys stole it, you know, and uh, so they're like passing it around, all the FedEx guys, and, uh, you know, so this guy had some, and he's like, hey, I got to work the night shift, so will you please hold on to this t- for me until morning, and uh, in the morning when I get off work, you know, we'll, we'll have fun, party, get drunk, etc. So needless to say, you know, his stuff was gone come morning time, and, uh you know, I had learned all these things, though, you know, going to this outpatient. So when uh, when he called me up and when I went over to his house, I said, well, I got some good news and I got some bad news. I said, the bad news is your stuff's all gone. The good news is, though, I think I'm powerless. And uh, so, you know, a couple of days later, I'm drinking more still and I'm going down this outpatient and I'm just like, I don't want to go. This thing's a waste of time. And uh, and basically what happened was, uh, you know, they sent me off to... Uh, 30-day program. They said, okay, enough's enough. They shipped me off for 30 days, and then I got introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, you know, it's been a great life in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new, um, you know, what happened for me was, you know, I, like I said before, I identified. I identified for the first time with what people were saying. So if you're new, you know, try not to listen for the dissimilarities. Listen for the similarities. And if you're new, get a sponsor. You know, I've been blessed to have, uh, you know, two great sponsors in my sobriety. You know, Steve Z was my first sponsor, and, you know, he got me marching in the group, got me involved with the activities and what we do around here, doing the deal. And about six years sobriety, I got Byron as my sponsor, and, uh, you know, he's, he's helped uh, develop my life tremendously since then. And I've become this great, uh, you know, human being as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, you know, I got married. I've had a son. Uh, I've been to finance class. You know, my finances got wrecked in Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, Vince Cio and the, and the finance class straightened them out. And, uh, you know, I've just done the deal here. And, uh, you know, I've been very active and very busy. Uh, my place, my head's a bad place to be in. So I recommend, you know, definitely getting active. Uh, Sean and I, we've been doing this golf tournament for about 15 years. And it keeps me busy about nine months out of the year. So I only got three months to worry about. And, uh, you know, the other three months I worry about working some other stuff. So, you know, if you're new again, I want to thank, uh, I want to remind you, please, just uh, stay here, do what we do here. 
Again, thanks, Kim, for allowing me to share. Thank you very much. Tonight, our main speaker is Danny T. My name's Danny. I'm an alcoholic. Wow. Uh. <laughs> Gee, what do you feel like the judge up here? And by the light. Uh, they always talk, uh. You know, I I got here in uh, 1968, and I was uh, I was in the penitentiary. And, uh, wait, that's a lie. I got here the first time, 1965. And, uh, I was in the penitentiary. And, um, <laughs> no, wait, that's a lie. I, I got here the first time, 1963. And, uh, I was in the penitentiary. And, uh, it's funny because the first, you know what, the first AA meeting that I ever walked into was actually in 1959. And uh, so I know everybody's like, wow, oh, yeah, yeah. I got to tell you, there was, a, there was about 20 of us cruising around, you know, like a whole car load, and, uh, and we're like, uh, <laughs> we're driving around the neighborhood, my neighborhood, Pacoima, we we're looking for parties to crash, and uh, in 1959, and we've seen about 30 cars in front of this old house and it was on, on right on the corner of Van Nuys Boulevard and Lev Street. Now for Coimo, that was the murder capital of the world at that time and it's amazing for somebody to have a party or they had a lot of parties or a like a baptismal a lot of baptismals in that area or barbecues, a lot of barbecues, you know, or quintineras, uh, a lot of those, uh, a pardon? No, not in that name. <laughs> but for them to be having an event in the murder capital of the world and not invite the murderers was like really dumb. So we stopped the car, went to the trunk of the car to get the tools necessary to crash party. We got tire irons, pieces of pipe, bumper jacks, hammers. I had a case of beer, three bottles of wine, a half pint of whiskey, and I was already loaded on red devils, red devils, red devils. We kicked in the front, you have to kick in the front door. Because when you crash a party, you can't like... They locked the door and called the cops. You know? So we kicked in the front door and everybody rushed in. And we're standing there. And the first thing we saw was a big sign that said, We care. <laughs> and we had just crashed the Friday night meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, the We Care group. Still there. It's not, you know, it is no longer on Van Nuys Boulevard and Lev Street, because now the five freeway goes over that. You know what I mean? But they moved it, but the We Care group is still there. And uh, it was amazing. But that was where I was given the curse of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there is one. Never understood it. I walked into that meeting, and immediately I saw what was up when I saw the basket. And, uh, this is church. That means anything that is even remotely fun is a mortal sin. Yeah. Or a venial sin is remotely. Anything that is fun is a mortal sin. And, uh, you know, consequently, I wanted to leak it in me out of here. And, and I turned around to get my troops out of there. And what you guys did was that divide and conquer. You had everybody in little groups of like four. Lost all power. And it was amazing because, see, there's only two greetings you can get when you crash a party. 
either everybody rushes to the opposite side of the room, that means they're willing to throw the party in your honor, <laughs> or they rush to the side of the room that you're on. That means they're not. So it's very simple. We got like the stupidest greeting in the world. We got, hi, I'm Bob. Well, it's dumb. Everybody rushing. Hi, I'm. I said, let's get out of here. <laughs> this guy comes over and says, whispers the curse of alcoholics and all. Straight up. This guy says, Danny, why don't, I'm holding a case of beer, three bottles of wine, a half pint of whiskey. And this, this guy says, put that stuff outside, Danny. And come in here. Join us. And I said, out of here. You got penitentiaries to go to, buddy. <laughs> and this guy says, Danny, if you leave, you will die, go insane, or go to jail. Now, did you hear the quiet? See? That was the voodoo of Alcoholics Anonymous right there. <laughs> you all heard it. See? You should have did what I should have did. When that guy whispered that curse, I should have went, I can't hear you. <laughs> I didn't do it. And neither did you. So, the most profound thing that anybody has ever told me on this program was that if I leave, I will die, go insane, or go to jail. And believe me, every time I left, pow, I'm in jail. <laughs> and it's amazing when you see those lights behind you. Those lights are actually time. Look at them. They go, die, go and say, go to jail, die, go and say, go to jail, die, go and say, go to jail. They do. Damn. <laughs> four months, probably four months, five months after I hear, four, five months, I don't know, but five months after I heard this curse. The cops, bam, kicked in my front door. Didn't just come right, no, that's a lie. The cops kicked in my mom's front door. <laughs> I got sent away for a while, got out, and amazing. Got arrested again in 1962. I was in the California Youth Board. And I had this, this guy that named Frank Russo, this friend of mine, Frank Russo, Frank Russo, Frank Russo. And I say that because he told me never to mention his name. And uh, uh, this guy invites me to this meeting. He says, come on, Dan, you want to go to A? And I'm, you understand, I'm a journeyman convict. There's no way, journeyman convicts don't go to meetings. And he says, Danny, there's going to be coffee and cake. I, Excuse me. You're talking to a journeyman convict. I got people bringing me steak sandwiches. Yeah, but then they give cigarettes. Uh, excuse me, journeyman convict here. I got cartons of cigarettes. Danny, there's going to be some women, huh? And being in prison, is it real women? No, you no. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 we got him. I go to that meeting. I, where do I sign? And I signed the worst thing in the world you want to do in the, I forget, I signed the list. You see, I got on, oh yeah, I signed the list. And when you sign the list, it's not like, I want to go to AA to see the women. You say, it says, I have an alcoholic problem. I would like to sign up for Alcoholics Anonymous. That in turn goes into your jacket. Your jacket follows you everywhere you go. Oops. So I go to the first meeting. I, I, I met 
guy that I absolutely love, Johnny Harris. You know, he's here. I remember when he saw me coming, he goes, oh, God. I was so shocked. I mean, I was so shocked. If I remember, it's funny, he was dressed like I am right now. And I was in state blue, or I forgot, I think I know we were, I, I was sharp, whatever it was, I was. <laughs> and he was just like, oh, he knew, he knew that the, that the balls on my feet tickled me when I walked, I was so cool, he knew it. And, uh, he says, Danny, I hate to tell you this, but the only thing that's gonna beat you to the penitentiary are the headlights on the bus. <laughs> What's your point? <laughs> trying to tell me, I remember, I remember when I, you know, I don't see, cause I, but I went there for the girls, cause I remember the following week, Frank says, hey Dad, are you going to the meeting? And I'm, I hear me, are they, are they gonna be girls? He says, no. <laughs> well, no, I ain't going. But, I was on the list. And what happens when you're on the list is when they announce Alcoholics Anonymous is now meeting in the visiting area, all inmates wishing to attend. What happens is prison guards and you know, along with police. I'm not saying anything bad, Frank, about but but they're not like mental giants. <laughs> and I was on a list. And he looks, this coincides, my name coincides with a number of, and then he pulls this lever, that opens my cell. And I lean out and I go, hey, I don't wish to go. I, I close my cell. What happens when I close my cell, my bar goes back up. How do you say my my bar goes back up. That uh, he, he gets mad at that, and he can talk to me. He goes, <coughs> what that says is, you better hurry up. And opens it. I, I don't feel good. And I close the door. <laughs> they got people that walk around in, 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 in youth authorities. That make you feel like going places. <laughs> and one of them just happened to be going by. Oh, I feel like going. And I went. I ran into a guy named Eddie Cochran. And Johnny used to bring these guys. Oh, God, some flip. Laugh at ourselves. I mean, because it's funny. People would talk about, hey, yeah, nah, we don't, we, we're all showering with 50 guys. And everybody's like, ha ha. Oh, so funny about that. <laughs> I don't. And so, so it's like Alcoholics Anonymous made me laugh at myself in prison. And then when I got out, I remember Johnny saying, Danny, why don't you give yourself a break? And I'm like, ready to, I'm so ready to run. It's unbelievable. I could, I, to show you, I bought two short dogs. I'm not an alcoholic. I bought two short dogs at the bus depot. They took me to the bus depot to drop you off, and then you're waiting for the Greyhound. I got two. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm just going to socially drink on the bus. It's against a lot of drink on the bus. And I'm just going to ride home, just for the ride home. I got out on Friday. I got home on Wednesday. It's a two-hour drive. And needless to say, 100 days later, you know, handcuff, come on out, we have a house, all that, you know, all that, uh, uh, die, go insane, go to jail, die. They told me that was going to happen. And if you're new, I'm telling you that's going to happen. Do you understand? They say, you know, I mean, I know they're not supposed to. Like, take people's inventory. If you leave this program, you will die, go insane, go to jail. Period. 
In the 35 years that I've been clean and sober, nobody has left and called me up and said, Hey, Dan, I am having a great time out here. <laughs> Dan, wait, listen. You know, I, yeah, I'm drinking. I'm drinking a little socially. Yeah, doing a little. But you know what? My kids love me. I'm buying them all big wheels for Christmas. Hey, I'm getting my 16-year-old a car. I, yeah, life's good. Nobody. Everybody that has left this program, what happened? I get called. 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> oh, God, Dad. I can't do it no more. She's left me. They've left me. I'm in jail. Can you bail? No. I'm not the best person in the world to call if you slip. I used to get mad at people that slip. I'm telling you. People would slip. God, I, I slipped on... Wednesday, on Tuesday, but thank God I could make it back for the Wednesday. Shut up! I slipped in 59, got out in 62. <laughs> slipped again in 62, got out in 65. Slipped again in 65, got out in 1969. Did not want to slip no more. 1968, I understood what they, and I was getting out of prison, I remember when I was getting out of prison in 1969, I said, why? I've been going to AA for a year. I've been clean for a year. Why do I want to leave this place? Go out. Play that game with my parole officer. No, 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 no. Yeah, test me. I'm clean. I don't care. All that crap. You know what I mean? Do all, shut up. Give me your money. All that. Do the whole thing. End up right where I'm at. Why don't I just stay? <laughs> so help me God. You know what? So help me God. I heard. Johnny here say, why don't you give yourself a break and join us? And I heard that in like 1963 when he said it. And I heard it as plain, like if he was in my cell. Why don't you give yourself a break and join us? I, I got out, I called, I called that Frank Russo, Frank Russo, Frank Russo. <laughs> he, he came pick me up. I was having a lot of trouble with I gotta tell you though, I was having a lot of trouble with alcoholics on because I was I was hearing people always talk about what they had. People would say stuff like, I drank for 50 years. Damn. If you're 20 years old, damn, I got 30 left. <laughs> and I had a car, a boat, a cabin in Mammoth. And my business was thriving. I was drinking scotch. And from scotch, I went to bourbon. I think that's a step down. I don't know. I'm not sure. I, don't, I have no idea. And from bourbon, I went to beer. I ended up drinking wine. And I'm sitting there going, oh, okay. Was there a point there? I missed something. And someone else, what do they do? They get up. <laughs> I drank for 55 years. I had a car, a boat, a cabin in Mammoth. My business was thriving. And I was drinking scotch. And from scotch, I went to bourbon. And from bourbon, I went to beer. I lost all my material wealth. And I ended up drinking wine in the morning in an alley. That's where I ended up. Everybody would go, oh. I'd go, screw you. I started drinking wine in the morning in an alley. The hell happened? I'd never had a job before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, never been out of Pacoima, and a mammoth is a hairy damn elephant. I used to pull people outside and say, shut up, I was having so much trouble in Alcoholics Anonymous because the way people burn me for everything. And I went to this guy named Sam, Sam Hardy, and, and, and he was a Big old hillbilly. He did about 13 in, in Vacaville for killing some dude. And, uh, and I said, Sam, what is wrong with me? Man, I'm having all this crap. And I'm still having a lot of problems with people. And I remember, I remember playing. Well, then they. It's a hillbilly. Well, then they. What's wrong with you? Is you're not a nice person. Is 
if this guy wasn't about 6'2 and about 230 and, and killed one guy and crippled another in an argument, I might have jumped on him. But you know, <laughs> you're not a nice person. You're self-centered, you're egotistical, everything has to be about you, you're rude. Uh, you're not a nice person. <laughs> In fact, you have a twofold problem. You're not only not a nice person, you don't look like a nice person. <laughs> and then he says it. He says, you got to start doing things and not expect any kind of reward. And that's a hillbilly. Reward word. <laughs> if he would have said it in English, I could have forgotten. But nobody can forget. Reward. <laughs> and it stopped. It stopped. And I'm like, I ain't, I ain't, oh, he's crazy. But two months later, I'm sitting at a place called The Nest in the valley. And these three guys come in, right? And they come running in like, hey, we're going to go on a move. And one or two, one guy jumped up, all right. And a move, a move in Chicano is a movida. A movida means I know somebody that wants that. So I will get this, give it to this guy, and, this, and we'll get money. That's a movida, in case you dummies don't know it. So here I am sitting in the AA, and somebody runs in and says, hey, we're going to do a move. And I'm just, well, at last, somebody knows what they're talking about. <laughs> I jump in a pickup truck. There's about three of them outside. And I'm going with this group. And and we pull up in front of this nice house in Reseda. Pretty nice house. And we go, wow, what are you, like straight out burglar? What are you guys, wow. These, these guys got, well, wow, wow, man. And we run into this house and we're taking stuff out. Cool. <laughs> TV, I'm thinking. And we're putting all this stuff in the, in the pickup truck. And, and that, now it's got to be about one o'clock. We started about 11. It's one. And I'm talking about, hey, hey, what's this broad paying an hour? I thought, you know, what's she paying an hour? I realized now, no, we're moving. You know, we're, we're, we're moved. This is a move. This ain't a movie. Somebody burned me here. See? We're moving. And I'd say, okay, well, what are they kicking down an hour? Automatic. Somebody's got to be paying an hour, you know, hourly. Somebody's making some money. And they kind of laughed at me. I wasn't being funny. I said, what are we making an hour? And they're, I can't move. Wait, wait a minute. And then when I realized we're doing this for free, I said, wait a minute, man. I said, this broad's going to at least kick down with a sandwich. <laughs> And one of the guys kind of pulled me aside. The guy didn't stand, pulled me aside. Danny, listen. Hey, if this person get down with a sandwich, she'd feed her kids. What do you mean? He said, oh, yeah, her old man got busted. Her old man got, then it was a, it used, it used to be a, under the influence. It was a 502. Now it was, a, but he got, he got a, he got a 502 and that was his second one. So he's like doing 30. She lost everything. So, so all of a sudden, we get back to the nest. They moved her into like this little, somebody had given her, a, let her live in a little guest house and with her two kids. And it was like this tale of, whoa, what is this? And then, and then these guys are back at the nest and they're all walking around like, hey, Dudley, do right. Give me a badge. Give me a badge. They're like, they're like on, on a cloud. And I'm like, this is stupid. I was so angry. Something is wrong here. And I went back to Sam and I said, Sam, what is wrong? These guys are walking around like they're some kind of hero. I'm pissed off. You was expecting a reward. <laughs> and then what does he say? He said, it would have never been enough. If she gave you a sandwich, it would have been the wrong kind. If she gave you money, it wouldn't have been enough. But the reward was in the doing. You'll find that out if you stay with us. And when he said that, it was kind of like, oh, you mean there's a chance I might not? You see? Attitude. I want the world to change. It changes my attitude. Mine. And I started watching people. I started watching these people be of service. And I couldn't. 
I'm sorry. I wasn't one of those people. I wasn't. I hated them guys. I started taking out trash on my mom's block for the old people. I would just go and I'd pull out their trash. I'd go in and I'd pull out their trash. I remember going into this one lady's backyard and these are my neighbors and her screaming, I know me Roma don't feel nothing. Yeah, take it your trash. <laughs> put out, put out. <laughs> and that's all I, that's how I started, started doing. Taking out people's trash. And pretty soon it's funny, the first sports coat I ever got was from one of those Old man, my mom said, he won't. And he said, he won't. And then he gave me a And then he gave me a jacket from Japan that the, the people, the, the, the soldiers used to send over. One of those jackets from Japan. And I, God, those things are worth about a thousand dollars. I would have kept that sucker. But, and, and, and all of a sudden, these three well words started coming in that I didn't ask for. And I started understanding what you people were talking about. Wow. It's about doing stuff. It's about becoming a better person. That's what this is. I can't stay the guy I was and stay clean and sober. There's no way. There is no way. Everything good that has happened to me on this program has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. Everything. Absolutely. I started a career. I went on a 12-step call. Kid calls me up. I feel like music. You mean you haven't? I usually get bar. I get calls from bars at like ten to two. Hey, I am. I I need a meeting. No. no, 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 no. Give me the address because you need an ass whipping for calling me, you damn. I'm not a good person to call if you're loaded. I'm telling you, don't ever call me tweaking from your closet because I'll get you. Yeah. I'm just standing, standing, wait, I gotta go, I'm, I can really, I can, I can, shh, be real quiet, because I went to your house, and they really are out there, I swear to God, oh, and then I'll call you back in about 20 minutes, go, ah, 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 call me, ain't my fault you got loaded, not my fault you got drunk, here's this kid calls me, I feel like getting loaded, Whoa, that's like, that's like a, that's like God. <laughs> Whoa, God, you fit me. Whoa, hey, blue. You mean you haven't downloaded? No, 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 but I, there's a lot of blow at my job. Come on over. I can, I'm working. What do you want me to do? Can you come down here and just hang out with me? And I figured I was going to go down to his work. Hang out in the parking lot. He was going to come out for a break. We were going to smoke cigarettes, drink coffee. He was going to go back in. Everybody's going to think we were gay. And then, oh, no, it's okay. Who cares? And, and, he, and it was okay. And, 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 then, and then I would either wait for a break or you know, he'd, I'd, I'd go home. And instead, I walked on, I walked on a movie set, a runaway train. Do you understand? This guy was a PA on a movie. I walked onto this movie. I'm like, wow. The cutest thing you've ever seen in your life. All these kids were dressed like convicts, all of them. All had fake tattoos. All of them. All had these fake tattoos on them. And uh, I kept going, oh, oh man, I'm sorry, that's mirrors. I'm out. And, uh, and they're all trying to be so hard. Hey, your mother, hey, your mother's mother. And I'm going, oh, wow. You are really, t yeah, you would definitely be somebody's wife. I'm making fun of everybody. I'm having a blast. And this guy comes up and says, hey, do you want to be in a movie? And I go, what do I got to do? He says, uh, can you act like a convict? I'll give it a shot. And uh, all of a sudden, they give you those blue pants. I wear them well. Those state issue just kind of draped on me. There's some of us that just have a kind of body that, that you just look cool in. And then they give me a shirt. And when they give me a shirt, I take off my shirt. Now, I have this tattoo on my chest that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't say I love America. And it doesn't say mother. 
You understand what it says is penitentiary. The minute you see one like that, oh, he was in the pen. And this guy goes, oh, here, wait a minute. I'm trying to figure out what damn neighborhood is that. <laughs> this other guy comes over and says, hey, you're Danny Trail. I said, yeah, you're Eddie Bunker. We started talking. He says, like, what are you doing here? And he says, I wrote the screenplay. We were in the pen together. He said, Danny, I saw you fight up in Clinton. I said, yeah. He goes, hey, do you want a job? We need somebody to train one of the actors how to box. And I said, yeah. I, I was kicking down 50 bucks because they were going to give me 50 bucks for every time. He goes, they'll give you a 20 a day. I said, how bad do you want him beat up? <laughs> I'll figure out, beat him up. Write about it, show it to Sam. Sorry, I was expecting the reward word. <laughs> and he goes, no, 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 you got to be real careful because this kid's a little high strung. He might sock you. For $320? Give him a bat. Are you crazy? <laughs> I started training this actor out of box. He liked me. The director liked me. All of a sudden, they said, you be in movies. 1985, I got Taft Harvey, my say, whole life changed. Again, 17 years sober. My life, wow. All of a sudden, everybody's calling me mister. People are like fixing my hair. I got to wear like makeup, and it wasn't an issue. <laughs> so funny. It is so funny. When you start first start acting, and they put makeup on you, you're like, oh, oh, oh yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, all right. Uh, you're looking around, see what he... Hour and a half later. Hey, am I shiny? Uh, can you want to check? What was that? Yeah, both of you. Yeah, yeah, both of you. Uh, everything good that has happened. I've done over 70 movies. I've done over 70 movies. I've done movies I don't even know. I see one. Wow, look, I'm in this. I <laughs> Unreal. Everything good that has happened in my life has happened as a direct result of helping somebody else. Period. I, I remember I was at the whole stuff. This guy lost his speaker, and he called me. Yeah, he said, I'm on this road. That's where I met my wife. I went to the meeting, and I was giving one of those one of those pitches that has like tears, so spiritual. I was, I know, really, it was almost one of those, like, Anya, I was like, oh, this is heavy. <laughs> and I'll never forget, she walked in, she was wearing a white pants, and, and if you pray, damn, you <laughs> gotta give everything in my mind, you shall come. Been married six years. And I never understood what it was to be in a relationship. That's the God's honest truth. I never understood. I, 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 got, I got three kids. Been married three other times. And have never been in a relationship. I don't know if anybody understands what I'm saying. When you're in a relationship, you have to do stuff. Like, come home. <laughs> That's always important. And preferably by yourself. So, and, and no hickey. That's not like a good thing to woman. So I ran crazy on Alcoholics Anonymous for a long time. I did not know what the word monogamous meant. I always, in fact, it's being, I gotta say that every male figure that I've ever known in my family got Uno en la calle, uno en la casa. What that means is one in the streets, one in the house. That's it. That's just the way it was. That's just the way it was. And, uh, but is the problem is if you, if you marry a Jewish woman on this program with some self-esteem, it does not work. <laughs> just doesn't work. And it's unbelievable. But I gotta tell you something. I, Honestly, would not want any 
marital extracurricular activity. I mean, so I, I love my wife. This pro, I heard the lady talk about, I got the perfect wife, I got the perfect house, I got the perfect job, I guess I got a job, I don't even know, I guess I get, I guess a job, you know, I, mean, I have more fun doing my job than any, I get to do, when a director says, okay daddy, what I want you to do, I want you to kick in this door, there's going to be 12 people, and I want you to really control them, so I get to, wow, I kick in this door, and I, well, shut up, I got to shut the, get up, and I talk bad, Oh, what you love me, I'll blow you away. I just, just and, whoa. All of a sudden, the director says, cut, cut. People come up, where did you study? You know. <laughs> these are... Dale's Market, uh, Rancho Market, I started, a lot of them don't get it. If you're new, you go to a lot of meetings. If you're new, you go to a lot of meetings. If you're new, you go to a lot of meetings. Si eres nuevo, vaya a mucho juntas. And the reason I say that is because when you're new, that's not what you hear. When you're new, somebody says that, what you hear is, a little of salario or a little. <laughs> and naturally, we're so dumb, we're sitting next to someone else that's new. What do he say? Ah, oh, some about his kids, I don't know. <laughs> so if you're new, you go to a lot of meetings. You get involved. Not emotional. You try to get involved with this program. And I'm telling you, it's like unbelievable when you finally really grasp. Because you got to understand, I fell in love with this program three years into it. I was like digging. Whoa, this is so cool. Yeah, we do work. Right. Okay, so I got to like do, okay, so it's an issue. Who cares? Yeah, somebody touched it. I don't care. It's right all this crap. Here. And I thank God that I had the kind of sponsor that didn't really go that deep. He just kind of like tore everything up and put it in the fire and went. I says, Frank, what are you doing? He says, I'm giving everything to God. I thought, wow, that's heavy. Ten years later, he told me he was joking. Work for me. And there's about 50 guys running around here that say, oh, I gave them all the gods. <laughs> so if you're new, you go to a lot of meetings. If you're new, you go to a lot of meetings. And I'm going to tell you something. And it's like, I love what I have today. I'm in love with my wife. She's a successful real estate woman. And I'm impressed with anybody that can, like, do paperwork. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't, you got, you're looking at somebody that didn't even make students. You know, it's like, I, I wasn't good in school, I didn't get along well with others, I was just, I was a maniac. And when I came out, what you people did was show me how to live amongst others. Not even, because it wasn't even like living in a free society, it didn't matter, because locked up I didn't do well. I just got more time. So if you're new, go to a lot of meetings. And it's a promise. Good things will come to pass. God bless you and thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.